welcome and uh, my my computer tells me it's one o'clock I think we're we're set to get moving um, help me along here I think the do we first order of business is to have roll call uh, do or do we do that just as approval of um, perhaps the minutes from the last meeting yes we'll just do that with the minutes okay I will call the meeting to to order this is funding and programming uh, on January 19th. So with that, uh, our, we have roll call. Uh, any changes to the agenda that anybody has? Hearing none, we'll move to item number three, which is the approval of the October 20th, 22 minutes. Anybody have any modifications or changes uh, needed? This is Merrick. Move to approve. Thank you. I'm seeing uh, Katie. Katie White is not able to hear me. Everybody else can hear me okay? I can hear you good, Carl. Okay, good. So that okay. might, must be on Katie's end. Good. So we have a, a motion. Who, who made the motion again? Scott Merrick. Scott made the, the motion. Uh, do we have a second? To Ashfeld second. Ashfeld second. Uh, have a motion and a second. Uh, please call the roll. Uh, eyes in favor and same name for name. Okay, um, Jack Forsland. Aye. Angie Stenson. Aye. John Sass. Aye. Jason Piper. Aye. Scott Merrick. Aye. Adam Jessen. Aye. Uh, Maddie Dahlheimer. Aye. Elaine Kotsukos. Aye. Cole Hineker. Or Steve Peterson. <clears throat> I vote present uh, just because I wasn't here for last meeting as a member. Thank you. Scott Janowiak. Aye. Bethany, I didn't know my mic was, this is Cole, I vote aye. Okay, thank you, Cole. <clears throat> um, Molly McCartney or Jody? Okay. Uh, aye, Jody. Okay, thank you, Jody. Colleen Brown? Aye. Innocent Ao? I'm going to, I'm here on, on behalf of, um, Innocent disease, Deepadi Alves, and I also say present. Thank you. Uh, Mackenzie Turner Bargain. Nancy Spooner Mueller. Aye. Aaron Bartling. Aye. Carl Keel. Aye. Robert Ellis. Aye. Brandon Broadhag. Aye. Ken Ashfeld. Aye. Nathan Coster or Katie White. Can you just remind me what we're voting on? I just jumped on. Oh, thank you. Uh, just the minutes from October 20th, 2022. Aye. Okay, and Ann Weber. Aye. All right, so. I, I believe we have more than uh, than half voting aye, so that motion passes. We'll move on to the next item on our agenda, um, which is moving right into our business items. The first is a uh, extension, a year program year extension request from Hennepin County for the Midtown Greenway program. Uh, anybody on staff want to summarize this one? Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, actually, we do have two items here. Uh, this one's a little new, this public comment and, ah, business, and then the tab report from Elaine. Thank you, Joe, for clarifying that. So let's first go to the public comment on the on committee business. Um, is there anybody uh, from the public on today that has a comment or staff, do you know of anybody who wishes to make comments today? We have not received any requests for public comment. So hearing none, I think we will move on to the tab report. And Elaine, could you uh, give us the tab report? Thanks, Chair. Um, tab met yesterday afternoon. 
um, um, for the chair's report. Vice Chair Debbie Gattel welcomed new TAB members and alternates. Um, Anoka County has a new TAB representative, Julie Jepson. Um, she was just newly elected as a county commissioner, and Matt Look will become the alternate. For Carver County, the new alternate is John Fahey. Dakota County, new alternate Bill Drosty. And Washington County, new alternate Carla Bigham. Metro Cities appointed Jeff Weisensel in November as a Metro Cities representative, and he's from Rosemont, and he, this was his first meeting attending. Uh, Metro Cities will be replacing the open position for Julie Jepson as city representative. Um, council appointments will be made in early February for the four citizen members whose terms were up. And the new, and then they will also appoint the tab or reappoint the tab chair in early February. The new tab chair for 2023 to 2024 is Jennifer Hager from the city of Minneapolis. For MnDOT report, Sheila Kalpi reported that in 2023, so far through January 15th, there were nine traffic related deaths on the Minnesota roadways. This is the same at the same time in 2022, 20 and 2022, but more than 2021. MnDOT is working on IIJA. They've hired a consultant to look at projects that can fit into funding categories to determine what to apply for. For the MPCUA, Todd B1 reported that Frank Kolash has been appointed appointed Assistant Commissioner for Air and Climate Policy. He will be the MPCA TAB representative and Todd B1 will continue as the alternate. MPCA has 664,000 available to, in grants to install level 2 EV charging stations in public places, workplaces, and multi-unit dwellings. The grant opportunity is open through February 28th, and the information be, can be found on the MPCA website. For the MAC report, Bridget Reef reported on the capital improvements and operations at MSP Airport. Airlines are using larger airplanes to carry more passengers, which helps with air traffic, and the air reliever airport operations grew during the pandemic. For the Metropolitan Council report, Charles Carlson reported on Deb Barber's behalf. Governor Walls reappointed Charlie Zelli as the council chair. He also appointed a Met Council 15 member nominated committee. They will review the approximate 90 applicants for the 16 council positions. The, <coughs> excuse me, the applicants will be narrowed down for interviews. Um, <coughs> excuse me, Met Council will also be appointing four members to fill the citizen tab member positions for tab districts E, F, G, and H and appointing a tab chair for the next two years. For the Suburban Transit Association, Gary Hansen reported that all suburban transit providers are experiencing slow but consistent growth and are about 50 to 60 pre-pandemic ridership. On-demand response service is growing with demand meeting or exceeding capacity. Southwest Transit is purchasing four electric buses and six electric vehicles. Southwest Transit is piloting a TNC or Transportation Network Company partnership with Lyft and is still in process. MVTA reached 1 million rides in 2022, a big step in full recovery. Plymouth is developing an express route between Brooklyn Center and Minnetonka and other western suburbs. For the TAC report, Jenny Hager selected the, that, <coughs> excuse me, TAC chair was selected for 2023 and 24. The TAC vice chair is Brian Isaacson of Ramsey County. And Jenny Hager reported that the technical committee selected their committee chairs. Chair of TAC funding and programming is Michael Thompson, Plymouth with vice chair Carl Keel. The chair for TAC planning is Scott Merrick with vice chair Angie Stenson. And then for business items, TAB approved the Max CIP that went through tech planning and tech in December um, and was held over because the tab um, meeting was canceled in December. So they approved that to move forward to the council for approval. <clears throat> they also approved a tab executive committee for 2023. The county board members will be Trista Mata Castillo and Mary Liz Holberg. Um, for the city first class will be Mitra Jalali, St. Paul. City members will be Mark Winshuttle and Mark Stenson. Citizen board members, Chris Geisler, and then 
member representing modal and remaining board members, agency board members is Brian Martinson. And then currently Chair Jib Hubland is serving and will likely be reappointed by the Metropolitan Council early February. And then Michael Barnes serving for MnDOT and then Deb Barber is currently serving as member from the Met Council and waiting for reappointment after council members are seated. They also approved the safety performance targets for 2023. This came through the TAC planning and TAC. And then there were four streamlined TIP amendments that came through TAC, Southwest Transit bus purchases for electrification. Um, it was six, four, four 45-foot buses and six cutaway type vehicles. Um, there was streamlined TIP amendment to approve, um, including three regional solicitation projects um, that were starting early and need to get into the current TIP. They approved a TIP memo for Minneapolis Broadway Street intersection improvements and Washington County Central Gateway Regional Trailhead. And then they had two information items on the congestion management process, the Twin Cities Congestion Analysis Handbook, and then the Regional Development Guide update of the process right now. If there are any questions, that's the end of my report. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, any members have any questions? Uh, seeing none, I think we'll move on with the agenda now. Uh, just would make a note uh, for folks to check the chat that Joe had uh, raised an issue with an old calendar uh, appointment that we uh, had in our calendars for this meeting starting at 1.30. And uh, future meetings will all begin and start at 1 o'clock rather than 1.30. And so he's recommending that if we still show those appointments as 1.30 that we should uh, delete them from our calendars. Okay, well, let's move on with the with the agenda. We're into the business section. First one is a request from Hennepin County uh, for a program year extension on the Midtown Greenway project. Joe, do you have a, a short presentation on this one? Thank you, Chair. I do. Uh, we have three program year extensions today. Uh, the bulk of our program year extensions tend to come in January as the deadline for the every given fiscal year is New Year's Eve. So this is the first one, um, Hennepin County Midtown Greenway. Uh, so they were, Hennepin County was awarded $1.12 million in the 2018 solicitation to construct ADA accessible access to the Midtown Greenway. And they're requesting that the project be extended from 23 to 24 after outreach uh, was negatively impacted by some of the events of 2020, uh, which diminished the ways that the city, I'm sorry, that the county could reach out to the community and build support for the project that could not be done online and so i'm going to show you the uh, little uh, there's a lot of attachments here i'm going to show you a little score sheet here it is so um MnDOT metro district scores each project based on their readiness uh and ability to to be um completed in the next year because obviously we don't want to extend them by a year and then have them fail to uh complete themselves next year um so in order to be recommended for approval a score of seven on these pieces is needed uh, they scored eight, as you can see, and for that reason, uh, staff is recommending approval. As is the case for um, this and the other two programming extensions I'll be talking about, uh, the, prog the projects uh, need to be authorized next year, fiscal year 2024, uh, but right now uh, it would be slated for federal reimbursement in 2028. Of course, it could move up if uh, depending on various things that might happen to our funding sources. With that, I would stand for questions, and I believe uh, we have sponsors here as well. So I would open it to, to Hennepin County or any additional comments that you would like to make. Hi, yeah, this is Amber Klein. I am the project manager for the project. I don't really have anything um, else to add. Thank you, Amber. Uh, members, do you have any questions for Joe or for the applicant? And uh, I'm trying to see if I see hands up. Um, if I'm not calling on you, please just speak up. Uh, not seeing any, any questions or comments on this item. Um, is there a motion? 
Motion to approve, Robert Ellis. Thank you, Robert. Second, Jason Piper Hennepin. Thank you, Jason. We have a motion in a second. Um, could we please have the roll roll call? Jack Forsland. Aye. Angie Stenson. Aye. John Sass. Jason Piper. Aye. Scott Merrick. Aye. Adam Jessen. Aye. Maddie Dahlheimer. Aye. Elaine Kotsukos. Aye. Cole Hineker. Aye. Scott Janowiak. Aye. Jody Carr. Aye. Colleen Brown. Aye. Deepa Dalvis. Aye. Um, Mackenzie Turner Bargain. Aye. Nancy Spooner Walsh. Aye. Aaron Bartling. Aye. Carl Keel. Aye. Um, Robert Ellis. Aye. Brandon Brodhig. Aye. Ken Ashfeld. Aye. Nathan Coster. Epstein. And Ann Weber. Aye. Thank you, everybody. Uh, that motion passes. We'll move on to the next item, which is item 2023-09. This is a, another program year extension request from Hennepin County for the Vernon Avenue Bridge Replacement Project. Joe. Thank you, Chair. Um, Hennepin County was awarded $7 million in the 2018 solicitation to replace its Casa 58, 158 or Vernon Avenue Bridge over the Canadian Pacific Railway, Rail, excuse me, Railway. The county is requesting a programming extension from 23 to 24 in order to better align with the timing of an interchange project that the city of Edina will be completing in the area to reduce congestion impacts on travelers. Mendot Metro District uh, scored this as well as uh, the previous application, and they scored also an eight on that, uh, needing seven to be recommended for approval. Therefore, staff recommends for approval, and like with the past project, it would be a 2024 project with federal reimbursement at this point scheduled for 2028. With that, I'd stand for questions. Thank you. Any questions uh, for Joel? Uh, or maybe before we go to questions for Joel, does the applicant want to add anything to Joel's presentation? Uh, this is Jason Stabell, project manager for the project from Hennepin County. Uh, I have nothing else to add. Thank you. Thanks for being here, Jason. Uh, and thanks for, for no comments. Uh, any Anybody on the, uh, the committee have any questions? If not, are there any discussion items from committee members on this item? And again, please just speak up if, if, you, if you have some. Hearing none, I would uh, entertain a motion to approve. Brown moves approval. Thank you, Colleen. A second, anybody? He likes second. second. Was that Jack? Uh, yeah, Morrison? yeah, Jack was in second. Second, thank you. We have a motion and a second. Please call the roll. Jack Forsland. Aye. Angie Stenson? Aye. John Sass? Aye. Jason Piper? Aye. Scott Merrick? Aye. Adam Jessen? Aye. Maddie Dahlheimer? Aye. Elaine Kotsukos? Aye. Cole Hineker? Aye. Scott Janowiak? Aye. Jody Carr? Aye. Colleen Brown? Aye. Deepa DeAlvis? Aye. Mackenzie Turner Bargan? Aye. Nancy Spooner Walsh? Aye. Aaron Bartling? Aye. Carl Keel? 
Aye. Robert Ellis. Aye. Brandon Brodhig. Aye. Ken Ashfeld. Aye. Nathan Coster. Aye. Ann Weber. Aye. Uh, hearing that, that, that motion passes as well. So thank you. We will continue on with our agenda to the next item, which is a our third program year extension request. This one from the city of St. Paul for the Kellogg Bridge Replacement Project. Uh, Joe. Thank you, Chair. Um, St. Paul was received $7 million in the 2020 solicitation to replace the Kellogg Third Street Bridge uh, from Broadway Street to Maria Avenue. The city is requesting a project ex program year extension from 23 to 24 after supply chain and cost concerns got in the way of completion. Um, so as I talked about before, the Mid uh, MnDOT Metro District scored this one and came up with a score of 10, which is um, one of the bigger ones we've seen and therefore staff recommends approval. And as with the last two, uh, it would be a 24 project uh, receiving at this point, 28 reimbursement. I believe we have uh, sponsors here. And with that, I'd stand for questions. And uh, like in the past, before we get the questions for staff or the applicant, would the applicant like to make any more additional comments? And uh, hear, hearing none, uh, does the committee have any questions for staff or the applicant? Um, I would have a question, Joel, having to do with the funding. I mean, there's a concern that they didn't have adequate local funds to cover the remainder of the cost because of uh, inflation and supply chain. Um, will the applicant have monies to fund this project when we extend it? Because I don't think the cost is going to go down any. Um, Mr. Chair, I'm afraid I'm not um really qualified to make that assertion um this is ann weber um i i believe that there's discussions of going back to the legislature this is colleen that's correct and they're going to be going back to the legislature to ask for funding which isn't so, guaranteed but right but we are uh, presumably approving this extension with the understanding that uh, funding will be provided locally for the remainder, right? That is correct. And Joel, could you clarify for me, in the past, uh, we've, we've been rel relatively easy on one extension. We would be very stiff on a second extension, right? If there's... Uh, not some very firm commitments to deliver the project. Sure, yeah, I would agree with that. There's been times where we've seen um, a second extension, but it's usually because of circumstances created by MnDOT or some other applicant, not simply because another scenario like this one plays out for a second time. The current policy says one year, one extension, so that this would be the only one they could request. Thank you, Emily. Any other questions or comments for you? Nancy. Yes, Nancy. What is the difference in what they need to make up to have this happen? Do we know? Anne, are you able to answer that question? I do not have the actual number. I think in the actual item there was a, a summary of costs. And it looked like the local share was, was, if I see it on the screen currently, is that correct, Joel? $3.3 million? I suppose so, yes. And uh, $52 million in, in uh, bonding. And I think is that including the anticipated bonding for this year if they're successful? I don't know. I believe so. The 52 million that is shown is um, money that they currently have. Currently have. So do you know, Colleen, what the gap is? They 
told me when we were discussing it, but I'm not sure right now, Carl. Sorry. I thought they were going to be here. <laughs> Sorry, Nancy. We're not able to give you a clean answer on that one. It went up significantly. It's more than that 3.7. Any other questions? Chair, this is Jason from Hennepin. Yes, Jason. Uh, Chair, just wanted to share an observation that um, the state has its local bridge replacement program, and I think within state statute, they identify priority uses for that funding. And I think one of the first priorities is to help supplement projects that have been awarded federal funding. So I think from a statute standpoint, the city's in a good position to help um, close that funding gap using state bonds awarded through the local bridge replacement program. Good comment. Thank you, Jason. Any other questions or comments? Uh, hearing none, is there anybody willing to make a motion to move this one forward? Mr. Chair, this is Scott Merrick. I move to approve. Thank you, Scott. And do we have a second? Ashfeld second. Thank you, Kent. We have hearing have a motion any second. Uh, could we please take the roll? Thank you, Chair. Jack Forsland. Aye. Angie Stenson. Aye. John Sass. Aye. Jason Piper. Aye. Scott Merrick. Aye. Adam Jessen. Aye. Maddie Dahlheimer. Aye. Elaine Kotsukos. Aye. Cole Hineker. Aye. Scott Janowiak. Aye. Jody Carr. Aye. Colleen Brown. Aye. Deepa DeAlvis. Aye. Mackenzie Turner Bargain. Aye. Nancy Spooner Walsh. Aye. Karen Bartling. Aye. Carl Keel. Aye. Robert Ellis. Aye. Brandon Brodhag. Aye. Ken Ashfeld. Aye. Nathan Coster. Aye. Ann Weber. Aye. Thank you for the roll. Uh, the ayes have it, so that motion passes. Uh, continuing on in our agenda, we have a scope change. Uh, request from MnDOT for a cable barrier median on Trunk Highway 13. Joe, if we could have a summary of this application, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so MnDOT was awarded $425,000 in eight ship funds uh, for 2024 in the proactive category as part of the 2020 eight ship solicitation. And this award was to fund a cable median barrier on Trunk Highway 13 uh, as shown in the red and blue in the map here um, between um, Lynn Avenue and Nicollet Avenue. This is in Burnsville. The scope change involves removing about 1.3 miles out of the 2.9 mile cable median barrier. So that would be removing the red and the blue would remain. Uh, the project is currently in the tip at $489,600 in HSIP funding. That's a little bit more than was originally awarded. The extra 64,000 and change was provided by MnDOT but not from the same pool as the HSIP solicitation. So MnDOT does have other HSIP funds that they spend uh, discretionarily outside of the solicitation that they can do things like that with. So that's why the numbers uh, might not match up uh, in terms of what's currently in the TIP. Um, so staff recommends approval for two reasons. First, it's unlikely that this change would have actually impacted the score, I, I don't know that I'm not part of that scoring process, but based on what the scores are, the length isn't really necessarily a vital part of that. Um, if people really care to, we can get more into that. Um, and then we tend to approve requests like this when there's an assertion that the removed piece will be completed through other projects. So uh, MnDOT 
and the city will be um, completing this through uh, a couple of other projects. And the reason that this is coming out of the project is because of those upcoming projects. Um, and so then, of course, the discussion that I've always been a little bit hesitant to make big uh, recommendations from is the federal funds. Uh, recent history does show that retention of the full federal funding award is typical when removed elements are being completed by another project, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, seems to be the case here. The applicant is um, citing 200, uh, about 181 million of our 181,000 of the federal funding as uh, connected with the portion being removed. Uh, the committee should reconsider whether it's necessary to remove that funding amount or just to allow them to retain it. Uh, I believe the applicant is here and I believe the applicant says they could use the entire amount on the remaining portion. And as I said, the, uh, the red portion will be completed by other projects at a later time. Uh, as I said, I think the applicant is here and I would stand for questions following any input they might have. Thank you Great. so much, Joe. Um, so this is Tassina Alam uh, from Mindad. I'm the project manager for this project and I don't have anything to add. Thank you. Thank you, Tassina. Any questions from the committee for either the applicant or for staff? Um, hi, Chair. Thanks. This is Maddie Dahlheimer from Washington County. Just a clarification. Um, so if they're awarded the full funds, um, that would that would still be used on the shortened segment. So that would be used on the blue segment. It's not that the portion of the funds for that cable median would be used as part of the, I don't know if that's a local project or other MnDOT project um, for that red segment. My understanding is that is correct, that they would not be used on the red segment, but that the red segment would be constructed as part of other projects. And Joel, if I recall, there were two potential projects that would build that, one a MnDOT project and one a City of Burnsville project. Uh, Chair, that's correct uh, in all parts of your point. And so it is not uncommon, um, Maddie, for a, uh, a, a, for example, something like the blue piece to to have seen increases and uh, to be able to absorb that amount of funding. Um, and so the question that we've had at times is whether or not they should do that or whether they, if they reduce part of their project, uh, they should give back part of their money. Uh, generally speaking, if they just reduce the project because they're not doing it, they do give back part of the money. Um, Historically, I think our recent precedent has been if it's going to be done somewhere else to be a little more lenient. I'm not necessarily seeing how to vote, but that is sort of the history of how we've been uh, addressing those kind of things. Thank you. So to be 100% clear on that, um, oftentimes the conversation is should they get the $181,000 that is being removed from the project? And I'm hearing Joe say that, and I've concur that our past practice in recent years has been that we would not remove that if there were assurances that the entire project would be constructed uh, in the near future by other projects. Which is the case here, as I understand it. Yes, and I may have. I may have overstepped my bounds that Mr. Chair, but to answer the original question, yeah, the funding would all go to what remains in the project. It would not be provided to the project sponsored by other people and what will be the red. <clears throat> Does anybody else have a question or a comment? So Joel, just to be clear, so we really have two questions to ask and maybe we can do that all in one motion. One would be to approve it and a recommendation on what happens to the $181,000. Actually, if we don't remove the $181,000, we don't need to do anything special with the motion, just approve it. Um, if we do want to remove the $181,000, we would have to, that would have to be part of the motion. Sure, I would actually suggest that the funding decision be included in the motion either way, because the recommended motion kind of doesn't address that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So if we, if someone is willing to make a motion, please include whether it includes the the removed portions funding. 
Mr. Chair, this is Colleen Brown. I move that the motion be approved with MnDOT retaining the original federal funds. Thank you, Colleen. Uh, do we have a second to that motion? Jason from Hennepin will second. Thank you, Jason. We have a motion in a second. Uh, all those in favor indicate by saying aye by roll call. Uh, Jack Forsland. Aye. Angie Stenson. Aye. John Sass. Aye. Jason Piper. Aye. Scott Merrick. Aye. Adam Jessen. Aye. Maddie Dahlheimer. Aye. Elaine Kotsukos. Aye. Paul Hineker. Aye. Scott Janowiak. Aye. Molly McCartney or Jody Carr? Jody, aye. Uh, Colleen Brown? Aye. Deepa Dalvis? Aye. Mackenzie Turner Bargain? Aye. Nancy Spooner Walsh? Aye. Aaron Bartling? Aye. Carl Keel? Carl? Robert Ellis? Aye. Aye. Brandon Broadhag? Aye. Ann Ashfeld? Aye. Nathan Coster? Aye. Ann Weber? Aye. Carl Keel Carl is aye. Thank you, Carl. Uh, Mr. Chair, are you struggling with audio? Yes, I, I apologize. I'm having some issues with my internet connection, so I turned off my video. Hopefully that will satisfy that problem. Um, okay, so I think the ayes pass, so that motion does pass. I think uh, we can move on with the agenda to our fifth item under business, which is another scope change request. Uh, will do, Mr. Chair, and I'll start by From saying the that... Paul for the Fish Hatchery Trail. Joel. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll start by saying that we're going to see the same omission on this recommended motion that we just saw, so something to think about for motioning later on. Um, St. Paul was awarded $2,216,800 in surface transportation block grant program funding for 2023 in the 2020 I'm sorry, in the 2018 regional solicitation. This award was to fund stabilization and reconstruction of the Fish Hatchery Trail from Battle Creek Regional Park to Warner Road near Fish Hatchery Road. Looking for a map here while I'm. The heck? My map seems to have disappeared. Hmm. Um, oh, there it is. Sorry. <clears throat> Uh, so roughly half of the 1.375 mile trail is located beneath the embankment of US Highway 10 and 61 running along here. Uh, and that needs to be stable and that is to be stabilized as part of the project scope. A slope failure in that embankment has damaged much of the trail. And uh, since the time of the award, MnDOT has determined that the erosion and embankment stability is of considerable concern for the highway and is budgeting a slope correction for 27 or 2027 or 2028. Uh, MnDOT recommended to them that the, to the city that it requests a scope change to remove the slope, slope stabilization from the city's project uh, because it would be redundant to do so with the city's uh, with the uh, MnDOT project uh, in a few years. So um, staff, uh, so the preferred option is to do the trail itself without the slope, slope stabilization, which is a smaller part of the project. Um, staff recommends approval because one, it's unlikely that this change would have impacted the score because it's a trail project. It's not really a slope type of project. And two, uh, the project is impacted by MnDOT's adjacent highway project, and that led the city uh, to coming up with the solution. It's sort of being impacted and delayed by another MnDOT project, or I'm sorry, by another project that happens to be led by MnDOT. So recent history shows that retention of the full federal award is typical when removed elements are being completed by another project. Uh, again, that's, uh, that comes to the question of whether or not to, uh, request any funding come back. Uh, MnDOT's going to complete any necessary stabilization, albeit about four or five years 
later than this project. Also, uh, if it does any damage to the trail, MnDOT will repair the trail as part of that project. And I believe we have applicants here for that. And otherwise, I'd stand for questions. Thank you, Joel. Uh, would the applicant like to make any additional comments? Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, Brian Murphy with the City of St. Paul Department of Landscape, or sorry, Department of Parks and Recreation and Project Manager for the Fish Hatchery Trail Project. Uh, we appreciate this opportunity to uh, listen to this request, and uh, but we don't have any additional comments at this time. Thank you, Brian. Uh, does the committee have any questions for staff or for the applicant? I would have a question uh, for staff regarding this one. Um, so is slope stabilization, I was kind of surprised that that was considered a piece of the scope of this project from our point of view. It, to me, that seems something like soil correction or that kind of thing. Was that specifically called out in the application as, as a component of the project or, or is that just a, a cost that's associated with, with the project? Um, Chair, I actually would, prefer to hear what the city has to say about that if possible, but I believe that was mentioned in the application. Okay. Brian, do you have any uh, thoughts on that question? Yes, I can comment on that. Um, it was in the application. Um, the city of St. Paul and the Department of uh, Transportation had been in communication since roughly 2014 when we noticed some uh, sloughing of the embankment and there were some short-term stabilization, I don't want to say stabilization, but um, just corrections to it, to the, to the um, sloughing. Um, again, in 2018, there was a larger uh, slope failure. And again, remaining in communication with the Department of Transportation, uh, looking at solutions. But at that time, uh, the Minnesota Department of Transportation didn't have any funding to put towards this. And that's when the city of St. Paul was able to secure funding for the trail, the complete trail from Battle Creek Regional Park to Warner Road and included slope stabilization to protect the investment. But as we developed the project and um, noticed that the slope failure is a potential larger um, issue along this section of 10 and 61, not just the isolated area that uh, had previously failed. Uh, MnDOT is looking to do a larger project to um, manage drainage and erosion through that area, protecting both the highway and the trail. Thank you, Brian. So uh, I presume that, uh, that St. Paul is uh, committed to keeping this trail operational and that it would work with MnDOT or uh, others to, to do whatever type of soil stabilization in the future that's needed. Again, I think uh, I think the commitment to the region is that if funds are provided, that there's a facility that's usable for the life of that. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions or concerns from the from the committee? Chairman, uh, John Sass, is the recommendation to give, uh, retain the full amount for St. Paul? I think that is up to the to whoever makes a motion to say whether that should be included or not included. Uh, our recent, as recent as five minutes ago, we have included that type of uh, cost to to remain with the applicant. If the if the if those project components are being uh, constructed by others, which they are in this case. Uh, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and make a recommendation to uh, approve the scope change and keep the full amount for St. Paul. Thank you, John. Do we have a second? Brown seconds. Thank you, Colleen. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, please uh, vote by saying aye and by roll call. Thank you, Chair. Jack Forsland. Aye. Angie Stenson. Aye. John Sass. Aye. Jason Piper. Aye. Scott Merrick. Aye. Adam Jessen. 
Aye. Maddie Dahlheimer? Aye. Elaine Kotsukos? Aye. Paul Henniker? Aye. Scott Janowiak? Aye. Jody Carr? Um, this is Molly. I'm going to take over from Jody and I say aye. Thank you. Colleen Brown? Aye. Deepa Dalvis? Aye. Mackenzie Turner Bargain? Aye. Nancy Spooner Walsh? Aye. Aaron Bartling? Aye. Carl Keel? Aye. Robert Ellis? Aye. Brandon Brodhag? Aye. Ken Ashfeld? Aye. Nathan Coster? Aye. Ann Weber? Aye. Thank you. Uh, so that motion passes. I think that comes to the end of all our action items or our business section today. Um, so we'll move on in the agenda to the informational items. Uh, first is a uh, update on the transportation policy plan on the 2050 transportation policy plan. Uh, Cole, are, are you prepared to make a presentation on this? I am fully prepared, Chair. All right. Uh, Bringing it up. Proceed. Proceed. Thank you. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm providing you all with an update. Can you see the presentation in presentation mode? I can see it. Yes. Good. So um, I, I I can't remember the last time we were at funding and programming. We've been working uh, for several months on the transportation policy plan, sort of setting the framework. Uh, we have a few different committees that I'm going to talk about working on this, but we thought it'd be a good time at the beginning of 2023 to let you know what we've been doing, as well as where we're headed, at least for the first few months of 2023, and how the TPP is going to come together over the next year and a half. Um, just a quick reminder on the planning cycle. Uh, we we did update the transportation policy plan in 2020. That gave us uh, a nicely aligned timeline to wait to do the major update for 2050 uh, by 2024 with all of the other system plans and regional development guide that's that's being produced concurrently. And and as a reminder, you know when we look at producing a 2050 po policy plan, we we do a lot of interim work to help inform new policies, new direction, um, strategic investments, things like that. And we do that usually through studies. And so later on in this presentation, I'm going to talk about some of the major studies that are ongoing concurrent with the development of the 2050 TPP and recognizing that a lot of those are in topical areas where we have some gaps in the TPP in terms of policies or strategic direction. And so a lot of the work that we're doing to date has been focused on those studies. And um, we're really getting into starting to work on the TPP this year. But just a note that that's how our planning cycle generally works. And of course, once we adopt the 2050 TPP, we'll start figuring out what the next round of, of new policy questions we have to answer through studies. A uh, quick update on the schedule. Uh, we started this work early last year, but uh, really started in earnest in the summer of, of 2022. Um, as I said, we've been doing contributing studies and plans for a while. Uh, we started some stakeholder engagement and, and we've been working on evaluating the existing transportation system, which is a state statute. Some of the early work that, that we've been doing is coordinating with our community development division, who's leading the regional development guide development, which includes uh, visioning ex exercise for the 2050 plan, You know, recognizing that the 2050 regional development guide is the overarching document that brings together land use, transportation, wastewater parks, um, and, and we take strategic direction from that regional development guide. Uh, along with that, we've been beginning to engage on TPP goals and objectives and policies and actions. Uh, these are the elements that are going to be at the core of, of the strategic direction for the TPP. You know, once we get more thoroughly through that work, uh, we'll start writing chapters. Uh, right now, if you're familiar with the TPP, the chapter structure is generally focused around modes and then topical areas like environment and equity. Uh, we're we're, we're going to probably propose some new content chapters for the TPP, but that'll be coming 
to the to the working groups that we have, uh, you know, in the first quarter or two of, of this year to talk about that. Uh, we expect to have a lot of our draft documents out in the fourth quarter of this year, and then we would start the formal public comment process and approvals in March at TAC planning, and that would carry all the way through almost the end of 2024 when the plan would be formally adopted after public comment. So this is the overarching schedule and some of the major tasks that we're planning to complete. Um, as I said, we do have a structure for advising on the TPP. Um, you can see uh, there is TAC and the subcommittees where funding and program is over there on the left, along with TAC planning. Um, a couple of years ago, I think it was about two years ago now, we formed technical working groups. Uh, we have one on bicycle and pedestrian planning, one on transit planning, and then we created one specifically for the 2050 TPP that is uh, made up of TAC planning representatives plus additional organizations that we think have an important role in helping us shape the 2050 TPP. So that group has been spending most of the time talking about the TPP. They meet monthly right after TAC planning has a short meeting. Um, so you know, if you haven't been hearing much about the TPP, just note that that group's been talking about it every single month uh, for probably about the last six to seven months. And parallel to that on the on the technical, or sorry, on the policy side, we do have a TPP advisory work group made up of a mix of TAB members, Met Council members, and, and some other agency representatives. A little bit smaller group, but that group is really charged with, with tackling the, the policy issues at a very high level, um, you know, taking direction from the technical group on issues that might require policy direction and advice. And so they've been meeting about every other month. I think they've met three times since we've started this process and we're, we're starting to shift to monthly just as the content for the TPP starts to pick up this year for that group. A little more detail on this one, um, it, just in case you wanna you know, read more about what I just said, but gives you some sense for who's on these groups. And one thing I also wanted to note was we, we are using some of those other technical working groups like transit and bike ped to dive into more details related to those topics. So um, as we have, you know, topical issues with transit and bicycle and pedestrian planning, we, we we're bringing some content from the TPP to those groups as well. A uh, quick update on some terms and definitions. This is was identified by our stakeholders as one gap in the 2040 plans across all of the systems was there was some inconsistent use of language uh, around structural elements in the plans. So early this this time, we decided we we need to come to some agreement on shared language across different planning efforts, you know, including the regional development guide, the wastewater system plan, the parks plan. And what we settled on is what's in front of you here. Um, the regional development guide, which is being led by community development, is, is going to be producing um, the vision, values, and some cross-cutting goals that maybe aren't system specific. And so you have the different definitions of what those are here. Um, and really the vision and values is kind of how do we operate, how do we carry out work, and, and what's the big picture that we want to achieve as a region. Whereas the goals get into more of the specific statements, um, and, and in particular we'll have cross-cutting goals, but then we'll also have transportation specific goals, you know, things like access safety that we currently have in the 2040 TPP. Um, underneath the goals, and this structure is actually pretty consistent already, already in the 2040 TPP, you know, we have goals, then we have objectives that that give you a more achievable target to reach uh, that maybe provides more detail in what the goal is trying to achieve. And something that's slightly new is that we have policies and actions. The current TPP has a list of strategies and uh, through internal discussions, we thought having more of a policies and actions approach where we set out broad intent on how we hope to achieve the objectives and then give specific actions that are tied uh, to those policies and, and particularly tied to specific implementers of those policies. So this is a new new approach and it's it's going to take us some time to work through some of the new elements like policies and actions and that's why that was such a big component of our schedule for this uh, develop, development of the 2050 TPP. Um, I'm going to go over what we've really been covering in depth at the technical working group in particular. Uh, to date. So we spend a lot of time talking about the 2050 Regional Development Guide. Um, at both the technical and policy level, we did have small group discussions on transportation issues 
And they really, our community development staff has done a good job summarizing what we've been hearing at those groups. And, you know, they've been reaching out not just to the TPP working groups, but to, to working groups across all the systems. And so they're trying to document all the things they're hearing from those groups, but they've settled on highlighting at this point four significant cross-cutting regional issues that have been coming up frequently in their, their discussions. Uh, the first one being equity and specifically that systemic racism and inequities are, are, are significant in this region and causing disparities uh, for certain groups of population. And that's an issue that we need to address. Uh, climate change is a risk to our infrastructure and, and vulnerable uh, communities. And, and that's actually an area that's, that's under talked about in the TPP right now. And we, we recognize we need to talk more about that. Uh, natural systems are important assets. And they're at risk. You know, if you think about things like our water, surface water systems, air quality, things like that, um, that's being highlighted as a major issue. And then public health, safety, and well-being. You know, and we we have a strong tie to this one with with serious injuries and deaths that occur in the transportation system and and trying to minimize those. Uh, but these are the four cross-cutting issues that have emerged to date. Not to say that we're not going to identify more. And also, these are not. The ones that are going to be transportation specific, but these are issues that that we've recognized kind of cross all systems, not just transportation. So we've spent a lot of time on this. Um, the other major phase that I've talked about was developing policies and actions. Uh, we we really view this as a three phased approach. Uh, phase one being, you know, we're not starting from scratch here. We're really looking at where the 2040 TPP says. Our strategic direction is confirming things that that we want to keep looking for gaps and opportunities uh, in the future, and then we'll eventually refine that down to a list for the 2050 TPP. Uh, one of the helpful pieces of this first phase is just starting to delineate. You know, we used to have strategies in the 2040 TPP. Now we're going to have policies and actions. So understanding how those two might relate to each other and what the different level of detail is going to be. Uh, we've had a few discussions at the technical working group to date, and we're planning to start sharing some more uh, in-depth content with them in the coming months and really start uh, going into phase two in the first half of this year. So that's going to be a big effort for this year for that T TPP technical working group. And as I said, we've had a lot of discussions about the ongoing studies. Um, some of them were introductory uh, presentations, so just kicking off studies like e-commerce freight distribution and regional transportation and climate change multimodal measures study um, other of them have been discussions or updates on on major products where they're where they're more advanced so we we did bring in MinDOT to talk about the statewide um, multimodal transportation plan and minship and we've been talking about the performance of the system as that data has been pulled together as well as things like the climate action work plan uh, the cmp handbook and, and regional tdm study so a lot of those have just been kind of updates, letting them know where we're at with those. Many of these projects have their own technical group that's also commenting on the products. And so uh, I would say a, the bulk of the 2022 on this has just been, been bringing the committee up to speed on what we're working on. Uh, one other topic that we've talked about is scenario planning. So the region uh, is doing some scenario planning exploration um, really focused on the land use side of things and trying to understand how different land use uh, patterns uh, in the future might impact some of our regional systems. And part of the reason for doing this exploration of scenarios is just uh, for those of you who don't know, you know, regional development and growth has sort of stagnated during the, the pandemic. And um, we can't kind of assume we're going to have the same growth patterns we've had historically. And so we wanted to explore a little bit more what different scenarios might look like from a low regional growth perspective to a high regional growth, and then from a more compact to dispersed development pattern. And just what are the impacts that might occur on our regional systems and how might we take that into consideration as we're doing system planning? Uh, none of this set scenario explanation, uh, exploration is meant to pick a scenario. It's really an exploratory uh, exercise to help us understand more trade-offs and uh, growth patterns and how they'll affect regional systems. So we're in the early stages of that, and I think they're going to be start to see some of the results of this scenario exploration in the next month or two at, at our committee process. 
just with a look ahead to 2023, um, we are starting to work on drafting 2050 TPP goals and objectives. Um, this is probably going to be in the next three or four months. Uh, we're also moving into those, as I said, phases two and three of policy and actions development. And then um, we've actually asked staff to already start producing chapter outlines by the end of this month. And so as those chapter outlines get a little bit more fleshed out into concept drafts, we'll start sharing those with the committee uh, in the middle of the year and really going into a more thorough review of all of the uh, production of, of the content for the TPP in the fall and, and, and towards the end of the year. And I did want to note, you know, all of this work and these drafts are going through that TPP technical working group with the expectation that members on that group will be sharing it with others in their agency for review. So we're not planning to bring content to funding and programming or, or TAC uh, in great detail other than updates on what that working group is going through. So, you know, if you have a member on that group and you're expecting to coordinate on the TPP, uh, just know, you know, that that expectation is there that those staff will be coordinating within their agencies um, where we're not going to all the committees with that more detailed content. And I did just want to let you know about one major piece that's upcoming. Um, we do have a consultant on board to look at TPP goals and do some uh, engagement with our partners on where the strategic direction for the region should be headed. Uh, they're currently working on um, creating a synthesis of goals and objectives and, and peer region plans as well as plans within the region. They're looking at all the county plans, a uh, select number of city plans and statewide plans and met council plans to see what are some themes that are consistent across all of the region's plans as it relates to transportation building off that they're going to do 15 engagement events with our stakeholders you know primarily local governments um, those are likely going to occur in february maybe some into march so we've already started to reach out and schedule those uh, th at this point, they're really listening sessions for us to just hear what what folks think are pressing issues moving forward for 2050. It will help give us a lot of great input to start creating drafts. We're not intending to create final versions of these based on this input, but more just what did we hear and how do they influence our draft goals and objectives? And then we'll do more outreach to build off of that. Um, they have a nine month timeline on this task, but really the focal point is gonna be in the next couple of months with that engagement effort with our local partners. And so um, a lot of staff, you might be hearing about uh, these, these listening sessions being scheduled and uh, plan to occur in the, in the next month or two. So with that, uh, pretty high level update, a lot more detail has been going through that technical working group and encourage you, if, as I said, if you have a member on there to reach out to them to see if there's anything you might have missed. Um, but that's the general content we've been covering and what you can expect in the next year. And I think just keep in mind all of this too when, when Steve goes through his regional solicitation presentation because these, these products are, are pretty well connected for the next two years of planning work for the, for the region. So. Would welcome any questions you might have on on the 2050 TPP development. Thank you, Cole. Uh, any committee members have questions or comments for Cole? Again, if you do, just please speak up. I'm I'm not good at finding hands in the participant list. Cole, I had a, a question about the thematic. Uh, kind of cross-cutting them thematic items that you discussed. Um, I was surprised that uh, finances or resources wasn't one of them too. I can't imagine any of our systems that aren't going to be stressed financially. Certainly transportation is. Yeah, it's a good point, Carl. Um, I, I will say that I think the themes have been more focused on, on outcomes, not more of what well, I don't know that I would call those administrative, but they're more process or need. And so I think those are going to emerge within specific system plans. So what we'll probably hear about that as we engage on the transportation system plan, but at the regional development guide level, they were more focused on, on outcomes that are people focused, if that makes sense. So I think we're gonna hear about that in the next phase for sure. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Thank you, Cole, appreciate the update. Thank you. 
and uh, we'll move on to our next uh, informational item, which is an, uh, an update of the regional solicitation surveys that were done uh, recently. Uh, Joel, are you going to give us a little presentation on that? Muted, Joe. I talked a lot there on mute, didn't I? Thank you, Chair. It was it was interesting. No, oh. um, I'm trying to clarify my my enunciation. Um, so I believe on your screen is the first page of that 29 or so page uh, attachment I gave you, and. Uh, that list of uh, 13 themes that we pulled out of, of the uh, surveys that we had following the solicitation. So to summarize what we did, we sent surveys to TAB members. We got 15 replies. TAC and funding and programming members, 10 replies. Scores and shares, 18 replies. And applicants, 17 replies. And uh, for the TAB, TAC, funding and programming, scores and shares, a lot of um, feedback came back about policy and about some of the uh, language and things of that nature. Applicant surveys are a little bit different. You don't see a lot of uh, what they said in these themes here. Uh, they tended to be about a little bit different with comments about maybe improvements that can be made to the web grants program. And we we look at those and uh, tend to agree with them, but we tend not to always be able to make those changes uh, logistically in web grants. It's kind of uh, rigid that way, but uh, we do, um, <clears throat> we do uh, look at all of these comments. Um, so if you look at these themes, it can be tricky to pull themes out. A majority of each of the surveys uh, responses are from open-ended questions. A lot of them are very unique to themselves, um, which makes it a little trickier to pull out themes. But this is what we came up with. Uh, we did um, add uh, the entire response, all the responses here, in case others want to pull out their own themes. So we found 13 themes. Most of these have been um, themes in the past, including simplification and discussion about uh, what people want to see for modal distribution or geographic distribution. I think a couple of new things we've seen include, if you look at number three, uh, some folks thought that maybe the um, uh, funding scenario process moved really quickly and that TAB wouldn't have minded to see a little more updates, maybe a little bit more description of what goes on to develop those. And as a staff, we, uh, we felt that that was a, a very fair set of comments and we're going to uh, try to make that um, a little clearer uh, going ahead starting in 2024. And if you look at number six and number seven, I think there's always people that maybe are pushing for more safety um, and things like that, but uh, safety and uh, climate change. But we saw a lot of it this time, a lot more than I think we usually do. Um, otherwise, most of what you see, I think, in one form or the other has been done before. Um, I think many of the changes in the specific measures are probably more likely to be addressed uh, heading towards the 2026 solicitation following a large scale review of the process. Um, you know, we've been using roughly this uh, solicitation for the last five or six uh, cycles, and we're looking at um, a, a big review that might result in some uh, different things. We might not be digging too deep into the weeds on some changes this time around. Um, and then, um, um, really, that's all I have. Uh, Steve or Cole or Elaine or somebody might want to add to some of the things they pulled out. Otherwise, uh, we'd be here for uh, whatever discussion folks want to have. Steve or Elaine, were there anything you wanted to add? Uh, not, not from my end, no. Thank you. I don't, we did get some feedback from Tab yesterday on because of the information items they had regarding the safety performance measures, that that is something that they would like to see an emphasis on in some fashion. So we'll have to see whether it's in scoring weighting or if it's going to be in waiting till the next redo. Thank you, Elaine. Committee members have any comments, questions? Yeah, hi, Chair. Uh, Mandy Dahlheimer again from Washington County. Um, so I, this is my first time attending this committee, so I apologize if, if this is redundant for others, but can you provide, or can someone provide um, just a little bit of background on the survey? And my assumption is that the feedback that received, that was received through this survey is being used as part of 
um, you know, maybe our next agenda item, the regional solicitation evaluation. I'm just curious to get um, a little bit more info about how this input is going to be used. Good question. Joe, I don't know if you have uh, any comments about that. I, I think you had sort of indicated that probably the bulk of this will be used to uh, influence the, the new application process that will go for 2026. I don't know if you have anything more to add to that. Yes, I'd share. So we've been doing this survey at least since the 2014 solicitation, and it has informed the updates to 16, 18, 20, and 22, um, along with verbal comments and things that uh, verb and um, discussion that occurs at meetings. There's not necessarily, um, you know, any way in particular that that uh, that's quantitative where we can say we are incorporating this here thusly but but these have this these comments have always informed uh the next steps and have always been a starting point for some of the things that we explore so going into 26 like themes like this um will be near you know on the list of things that are talked about early and often in the uh regional solicitation review that we're doing um starting Starting whenever Steve's about to tell you it starts soon. Does that answer your question, Maddie? Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Yes, Mr. Chair. Yes. Hi, this is Angie Stenson, Carver County, and I would uh, just like to say that it, it it seems to have been helpful in the past when we were able to make some minimal changes um, for the next solicitation and um, I you know, would be open uh, potentially you know, as a committee to to see any more administrative or smaller changes that uh, you know that were suggested as part of the survey that could be added to 2024 uh, 2024 solicitation. Um, seems like we have been you know pretty successful in making some minor changes in the past so um, i would still like to consider some of those for the next round thanks thank you angie and i presume that'll be part of our conversation about the extent of changes on the next item right sure i i would agree that's sort of uh um what's going to be talked about when steve presents or among what's going to be talked about when steve presents yeah, Ms. Mr. Chair, if I maybe just can jump in here quick to, before before we forget Angie's comment here. Um, so there, you know, there's a there's a gray area probably of what we can address uh, for this upcoming cycle. Again, we'll talk about this in the next info item, short shorter cycle. Uh, but things like rule changes, um, changing the amount of points that go to safety or this area or that areas, those are all. Um, easy changes for us to implement and with the goal that uh, the 250 million dollars of projects that did not get selected could essentially uh, uh, with with uh, just a little bit of time and effort resubmit their application uh, for the next funding round and so yeah i think we're um, going to be open to some small scale changes like that that i described here and i think that's angie maybe what you you were getting at so if I heard you correctly. Thanks, Steve. Committee members, any more comments or questions? Yeah, Mr. Chair, this is Cole. Yes, Cole. I just wanted to encourage everyone to, you know, it's it's long, but in, read through it. Um, I, I, I think it's just really helpful, particularly for us who work on the solicitation in detail. And if, if I were to highlight any section, I'd, I'd read the tab section, you know, just the feedback that we got from tab members. Um, I, I think it's 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 good to read some of the comments, you know, keep in mind that every comment is a unique individual and not <laughs> representative of the whole board, but sometimes reading through this can give us some insights on how we do our process that we might not have otherwise considered. So it, I think it's a good read for everyone. Chair, I am. It's cool. Chair, I have a couple things to add to that then. Um, each of the four surveys, we do have um, a set of themes that are a bit more particular to those surveys. So at the very least, you can 
read through those. Um, and then on each of these uh, responses, we tend to have uh, numbers. So you can match from question to question, number one. So if you see, oh, everybody's talking about VMT reduction goals, you might notice that, hey, it's the same person every time. So uh, just a couple of things to think about there. But if you don't, if you know you're not going to get to all the responses, at the very least, we do have um, some themes up on the first page of each one on these pages here. Thanks. Yeah, I I have a question. Um, this is Deepa. Um, was this Deepa? yeah? Was this document shared um, somewhere, or or Joey, or are you going to send it to us? Thank you. The document is on the agenda page um, linked here. If I if you want, I can send it uh, to you or to the whole group. But it is linked on the survey on the uh, on the uh, agenda page. Yeah, since I'm sitting sitting in for innocent, I don't think I have that. If you don't mind sending it, Joe. No problem. I will. Thanks, Deepa. Anybody else have a, a comment or question? Okay, not hearing any. I think we'll move on to the next item, which is very much related, which is. Uh, the evaluation of major tasks in our schedule for the next regional solicitation. Steve. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, uh, so this is an item that we did uh, present to the TPP work group. A uh, few members um, maybe saw a portion of this, but we did expand it since since last Thursday here um, to tailor a little bit more to funding and programming. So we wanted to bring with you a early kind of outline of uh, what we're calling the regional solicitation evaluation. Um, this was something that uh, members, uh, Carl, I know you were on that and many others were as well back in the 2012 to 2014 timeframe um, when at that point Thrive MSP 2040 was updated and the TPP was updated. Uh, then the, the task at hand was to make sure our funding programs aligned with the goals and objectives um, as stated in both the TBP and Thrive. So uh, Cole kind of went through it in the first information item. We're going to be updating both of those documents, regional development framework, uh, as well as the TBP. So again, want to make sure that those uh, new policies are incorporated into funding decisions. Uh, so this would, uh, this really three-year effort that we're going to embark upon uh, FMP will be highly involved, uh, but it will lead into the 2026 solicitation and set the framework uh, for funding in the solicitation for the next uh, 10 years or so. So we want to go through some of those tasks uh, today with you. So here's just a broad uh, uh, outline of uh, potential tasks. And again, wanna, this is just meant to spur additional discussion uh, with this group here. Um, put together a, a list of eight uh, high level tasks and certainly there's details within here, but um, complete a before and after study. Uh, this would be our third before and after study where we looked at projects that were uh, constructed and, and what did we get from uh, those collection of projects that we've funded uh, through the regional solicitation. Uh, complete a peer review of MPOs uh, and how they distribute their funding. You may remember from the last before and after study, one thing we learned is every region really does it uh, completely differently. Um, uh, there's there's many ways you can distribute this federal funding and no right or wrong answer to that. And, and so just exploring some of those again. Uh, to, to find the focus of the regional solicitation again, because especially the SDP money has very broad eligibility. Um, what does the region want to do um, with the money? And what's the kind of focus area? Uh, number four, again, we, we led the presentation with this, incorporate the 2050 TPP goals, objectives, policies, and actions um, into uh, the regional solicitation. We have a, the next slide, we'll get into that one in more detail. Uh, number five, establish uh, the best way and method and timing to select projects. Uh, currently, we do a call for proposals every two years, and, and uh, other regions, as I said before, do things um, on different timeframes. Um, Selection is very different, et cetera. Uh, simplify the process. So now you'll see a few things that came out of the surveys here just to tie, tie a couple ideas together. Simplify the process for allocation of funding while keeping that technical rigor. Uh, so that was uh, one thing we heard in the surveys. Engage with stakeholders in the public um, in the development of a new application and uh, document findings um, 
application materials. And and maybe a subtask to that would be we did hear a lot in the surveys about uh, more data analysis related to the bicycle pedestrian areas from either counting or predicting how the potential usage of those routes and or kind of uh, best practices for for counting um, after the fact. So um, back to this task uh, four. Um, we just illustrated an example of, you know, one of the likely goals coming out of um, the regional development plan and the TPP is something related related to safety and co -op went through went through that uh, equity was another one. So there's a lot of ways potential ways that you could incorporate that into the regional solicitation. You could have a, an application category that's just focused on safety. It's not modally based or project type based. It's just which projects. Uh, lend itself to the highest uh, safety benefits for the region. You could change the amount of money going to safety. You could have a safety criterion, uh, scoring measure, both of which we have right now, uh, change the point distribution, number five, or change the qualifying requirements so that all projects submitted um, have to reduce uh, the likelihood of uh, fatalities and serious injury crashes, for example. So. Uh, there's just a quick brainstorming I did of six different ways you could incorporate uh, these new new goals into the uh, funding process, and there's probably others too. So I uh, just want just meant to really get get you thinking about um, the connection between the TPP and and the funding. Uh, so other questions for the group uh, that we do have is: uh, Do you have any other key tasks that you'd like to see in the scope? Um, What's the best way to ensure that the 2026 regional solicitation is addressing um, the new goals and objectives? Are there other MPOs across the country that you'd like us to take a look at? Are the consultants to take a look at? Uh, what's the best way to engage you as a technical expert in this multi-year effort? And then lastly, uh, what's the best way to engage your policymaker? So those are some general questions and uh, we'll come back to those after I conclude the, the presentation. But did want to uh, kind of tie together the the twenty four cycle. So again, this larger three year effort twenty twenty six regional solicitation evaluation. Uh, there will there will be overlap with both the twenty twenty four cycle and the TPP. And so this led um, our staff to really try and overlay those three major processes. Elaine did some nice work in trying to schedule this out. Um, what might be possible? So um, in Lane. Laying those three study efforts up and thinking about kind of your time on committees that we'll be asking of you that which will be a lot over the next uh, two two to three years. Um, the the best schedule that we came up with was to advance uh, the next cycle 2024 by roughly four months. And and the benefits of doing this would be to um, twofold uh, one the. The final decision on 2024 cycle and the TPP approval would wouldn't overlap and wouldn't be in the fall of 2024. So that's number one. Uh, number two, the way we've set this up is that um, the TPP will uh, be approved and sent out for public public review at the same, and then during that public review period, we'll have a, some downtime um, for, for all of our committees. And at that point, we'll dig into the funding scenarios for that 2024 cycle. So we're trying to not overlap <laughs> the committees uh, too much to, to really make sure that each, all these processes get their due, due time and, uh, with our committees and with our TAB members. And so in doing so, moving it up four months, uh, that would uh, put an open, open application period uh, this fall of 2023, closing uh, early December. Um, the scoring would take place in early next year, starting about now. Uh, that would put the funding scenarios uh, spring, summer. Again, that would uh, be heavy time for these committees, uh, but the TPP would be out for public comments, so that wouldn't be going on. And then the TAB decision for the 2024 solicitation would take place uh, about July of 2024. Uh, so, Elaine, anything? I just want to give you a chance here as you kind of put together the master schedule. Anything you want to add uh, at this point? Um, not specifically, you know, in general, as, as we go forward over the next couple months, 
any changes we want or as a group that we want to be made, we'd like to have those identified quickly so that we can get the changes made onto the maps or into the web grants as we go through so we can get our staff all lined up to make those changes. So let us know quickly over the next couple of months any changes you would like to see so we can get the discussion through the committees and through TAB. Yeah, thank you. Good, good point. And so uh, the schedule as outlined here, we would hold tight on changes like functional class changes, RBTN request changes, bike barriers study changes. Um, and so that would not be down with the 2024 cycle. And that that's one way that we can save time. I mean, you'll still have opportunities to do that with a TPP and certainly with the 2026 cycle uh, moving forward. So that. Uh, that would be one one difference. Again, we would hope for minimal changes in the 2024 cycle and and really put our time and effort and uh, enthusiasm towards that 2026 cycle where we can have subcommittees and really dig into some of the key changes and really thoughtful changes that came came forth during the survey. Um, if you read through them, some really great comments. So uh, that's that. And, and uh, I'm going to go back to the questions here. And uh, Mr. Chair, turn it back to you and see if people have questions uh, first on the overall scope for 2026, and then certainly we'll take comments here on 2024 cycle and any kind of questions people have on that. So, Mr. Chair, back to you. Thank you, Steve. So, uh, do anybody have any questions on the the larger picture, right? The the scope of of this is question number one. Correct. Yeah. Anybody have any question? Carl, this is okay. Jason Hennepin. Go ahead, Jason. Uh, Steve, as part of the peer review, it may be interesting to ask peer agencies how they distributed the increased funding levels provided by IIJA. So, for example, like in the 2020 cycle, I think Met Council awarded around 200 million. And then in the most recent cycle, it was over 300 million. And I'd be curious to know if other agencies kind of took a different approach because it was new money you know maybe they didn't follow the the priority list or maybe they they chose to to place it in a specialized area okay yeah good good comment others you know what we we heard mr chair from even we had the the national conference was here in minneapolis this past fall at the end of october and other MPOs were were um, had the same challenges I think we were, and and that was time frame, new programs, and early money that had to be spent, and that were you know that was uh, a theme we heard across all the MPOs across the country is that how do you um, set up a process to distribute money in short order, um, and also meet kind of some new guidelines with these new programs. Mr. Chair, this is Cole. And maybe uh, when thinking about the other MPOs, Steve, you know, one, one of the things I've seen is that a lot of MPOs, and I think the last survey results showed they put some of this money on larger regional projects, which is just one, one approach. And, uh, and I'm wondering, like, how unique are we in limiting our funding pot to a minor system, you know, or lower and you know what? What are the conditions that created that in this region that are that don't exist in other regions? You know, and why are they why do they view it differently? So, I think digging into that a little bit might be helpful. If there's maybe one or two case studies that we could, you know, kind of address that. How did that come to be in this region that's different from other regions? Yeah, that's. Yeah, I, mean, that's I can yeah, I can look back in some of the history because this has gone back quite yeah. a ways of how they've. I mean, even before when we did the full redo of the. In 20, you know, 2012, 2013, TAB had put limits on maximums for projects. I mean, that's a TAB um, policy or recommendation versus a federal one. So there, and then the number of roads that are eligible is also was a TAB decision, partly because there's so many projects and just to prioritize where they wanted to put the funding. So, I mean, if others have not done that, or if they've got even more restrictions, I mean, there's going to be a variety of, there's no maximum you can apply for. 
maybe it's the higher classifications. So maybe that is something the consultant can look at and see if TAB wants to revisit that. We do get a lot of applications already. I, th I think there's a, another kind of piece to that is who has access to these funds. I think our process has been set up so that it provides access to cities and to counties uh, on a broader range of roadways. I think the idea is that more people have opportunities where some regions choose not to give that much flexibility. Well, TAB has been looking, you know, they want to spread the money around, I guess is a good way to put it. They want to get it throughout, instead of p picking two, three big projects to get most of the money, they want to spread it around. So that's why they got the maximum limits. And then, yes. Yeah, so that's the approach we've taken. And most other regions either don't have any maximum award. Um, one that we I think it may have been Denver or something that had a 20 million was the maximum, but most others had no maximum and they included freeways, um, which is obviously uh, state owned, but uh, system. But, you know, that's that's just the way other other uh, metro areas have chosen to do it is put it on a few big regional projects and uh, we've chosen a different approach and smaller projects, more app, more people are involved, more cities get some piece of the pie, you know, piece of the pie, I should say. And we also do over programming so that if we have projects drop up, we have projects to take the funding where other areas do not do that and then they end up turning federal funding back, which is a benefit to us because we distributed the, our region gets some of that money, which we put on two projects we've selected. Others have questions or comments. Yeah, um, this is Deepa uh, from PCA. Yes, um, Deepa. Um, given the climate change is going to be a bigger and bigger issue for us, um, I think I support the the larger regional projects to make sure that our existing infrastructure um, can withstand these you know, once in one, once in thousand year fl floods and, you know, situations like that, that we, we can, you know, our entire transportation system doesn't come to a standstill because things are going to get worse. Um, and so in, in that sense, I, I think looking at um, a bigger projects um, with, a, with a focus on the resiliency of our transportation system is is warranted. Good, thanks. Thanks for your comment. Appreciate that. I always ask this question at this time of the process is, are the questions we're asking picking projects? So, I mean, I know we have a, a fairly extensive uh, process and, and uh, an application and it costs a significant amount of money now to actually put them together. I don't know what the going rate is currently. I think it's 10 grand or 12 grand to do one of these things if you were to hire a consultant to do it. So they're getting more and more expensive. And in the end, all we're doing is distributing money. We're trying to pick projects that distinguish themselves from other projects. So I always ask the question, are the uh, criteria we're asking actually distinguishing projects. That is, how sensitive is it? Are the questions to compared to what projects we select? So you know, we may have a project or a, a question that takes an awful lot of effort to answer, and everybody gets the same amount of points. So it really doesn't distinguish that project at all. So even though it's an important item, it's not helping us select anything. So have we gone, th I know that uh, Steve uh, kind of started with an intern that we had who was good at statistics to figure out uh, which criteria actually contributed to a decision to fund. I can jump in on ahead, an example would be, you know, the multimodal measure where most of the projects are now putting in, we'll take roads, for example, some type of bike lanes or bike trails with it to get the points, maybe bus amenities. And so they're all scoring well, but if we took those measures that measure out, would they leave those out of the project? So it has a benefit to the projects that are being selected, but maybe doesn't make a difference in which ones are getting selected. 
So an option might be when we're looking at the redo, maybe if they're all putting, or majority of them are putting um, tr tr some type of transit or multimodal improvement, does this become a criteria or a recommendation as what you want as part of the project? Instead or of maybe, or maybe even ask them, are you including those because you get points or are you, or is that just part of your project? I, I would imagine it's the latter. They'll be part of the project no matter what. So do you want this to be a requirement of every project? Then you put it in the requirements. And then it went, you can then you can distribute your measurement points someplace else. But if you want every roadway project to have some type of multimodal, have a check mark that they have it just the same as do you have an ADA transition plan? Do you have some other other things that yep, are that yep. required? To be, I mean, those are things that maybe some of those measures can be looked at and have the groups decide. Yep. Would it be simpler just to check we've got this and it shows up on your um, your pl plan map to show that it's there that's submitted your concept plan, and then you just make the check mark when you don't have to write a whole several paragraphs explaining how it has multimodal benefits because it's required as part of the project. I mean, those are things you can look at through all the measures when we're looking at I think, it. I think that's a good, that's a good, good example. And yeah. we should maybe just look at all our measures and see which ones had influence on a, on a decision and which ones didn't. And then make the decision whether you want it to be a requirement to be part of the project. Well, I think that's sort of a different question. For me, the, the, the question is, did they help us pick the project or not pick the project? Right, because that's all we're doing is, is trying to pick projects. Yep, so that, that'll be, I think, one, one key, key part of the upcoming study is, is things like you're talking about, Carl. So I appreciate that continued input as we yeah. progress here. Yep. This is Maddie Dahlheimer from Washington County. So just jumping off of that point, um, I mean, I like the comments that have been made in the spirit of uh, simplifying the process. I think number six should kind of jump up to, <laughs> to number one of like, how can we simplify this process and how can we identify the information that is going into criteria um, that's, that's actually needed to demonstrate that a project is meeting, you know, these TPP goals. Um, one concern or one item that I want to just make sure stays on top of people's minds is to um, consider context, right? I know I know we're just using multimodal facilities as an example in this conversation, um, but certainly it's a big region and the contexts are quite different. So if we are going to move things into a, a project criteria over a project scoring, I feel like uh, you know, we need to make sure we're comparing how that um, impacts or how that applies to a project in Minneapolis uh, versus a project in Delwood in Washington County, right? So I think that's that's important to not lose sight of that that aspect of this um, this regional goal. Mm -hmm. Good comment. And that's been one thing that's been the odds is simplifying it, but then making it equitable for, I'm going to use that word, for all the applicants being able to score well. I mean, over since 2014, there's been changes made to the measures. They become more complicated to make sure everybody has a, a chance to score well. Um, one was on intersections, and then we had to add the railroads because they have different safety or crashes than a rather anger site. So they became more complicated over time when we had projects apply that couldn't score points on a certain measure. So we become more and more complicated to make sure everybody has a chance to get points. And so there's gonna be that balance of simplifying it, but then allowing all project types to score in some fashion. Any other comments? Mr. Chair, I just want to uh, say something building off of what uh, Maddie said. You know, I, I think one thing that we we underutilized that's that's a helpful context tool is the regional community designations. And I know some of our studies, like RBTN and and even functional class, to a certain degree, utilize community designations. But it it is a helpful contextual tool if we say we do have requirements or scores 
to maybe tie them closer to the similar community context that they'd be competing with. And so that might be one thing we'd have to think about is, you know, the, maybe the scores are um, compared across similar communities only or something like that. So just a tool to, I, I think, well, I can say with certainty, Steve, that those are not going away. <laughs> There's actually drafts going to LUAC today. Okay. And so that might be a tool that, that came together with the last solicitation and we never really incorporated it because the timing didn't work out, uh, even though some of our studies did. And so just maybe other tools at the regional level that, that might be helpful to try to int integrate. And I think that's really in probably task four, but um, a nuanced version of it. Thanks Thank so you. Much for designations. Yep. And that's, you know, we do have that, ru that rule, obviously, in the roadways about the A minor um, 21 of each uh, project type. And those project types are tied to land use indirect or directly, really. Um, and we heard, Maybe similar things in, in the trails um, bike bed kind of area here too that uh, maybe you should cons give some consideration to land use. So context. So good. Lots to talk about here in the next three years. Good. <laughs> Others. This is Scott. Scott, go ahead. Hi. Um, I think yeah, our process is okay. I think personally, I think it's a little bit too focused on the projects being the outcome. I think and uh, if you if anybody watched the tab meeting yesterday, probably saw that the safety performance measure topic uh, spurred quite a bit of discussion about safety. Um, so I, I guess I would, you know we're going to talk more about this next Tuesday, I guess, but um, I would just encourage us to continue to be thinking about the broader outcomes we want to achieve as a region. We have lots of policies in the TPP that talk to different different initiatives, equity, um, safety, uh, climate change was, men was mentioned earlier, um, bridge condition, uh, pavement condition, you can go on and on. So um, it's hard to measure everything, but I think to the degree that we're able, we should be looking at what the actual regional outcomes are of our project investments and those outcomes are generally measured in performance measures and targets and the performance measures and targets should have some bearing on how we invest in our system okay good points in previous years tab has had some discussions on what to prioritize and you know looking and they've looked at the tpp and there are so many priorities being done but they're not prioritized to which one to do more so tab has been reluctant to select one themselves so in the next tpp development it's when you they're selecting the goals and then objectives which ones should be used for the project selection because tab didn't have any basis to say safety was better than emissions versus spreading the money so they had to put points in for everything so because they rely on the tpp to give some direction on those priorities yeah hi Betty dahlheimer again um related to cole's presentation earlier with the updated tpp i mean at least how i kind of read the like vision and like the definitions that Cole presented, I mean, is there an opportunity to be very intentional about those objectives that we are defining and making sure they are the equivalent of like a smart goal uh, where that can be directly tied to scoring criteria and regional solicitation? I mean, I know that sounds like ideal world, like this is super clean and cut and dry, but mm -hmm. I mean, I know there has been, um, I don't know, maybe frustration is the right word in the past of, of seeing, you know, how selected projects meet those goals, but maybe that is uh, an opportunity to make a very direct connection, depending on what those objectives uh, kind of evolve to become. Good, yeah, th yep, thank you. I think that's a uh, point well taken on on that and certainly we have the federal performance measures now and then a whole host of other ones and uh, hearing from a few folks here greater time tying this all together is uh, maybe something 
people would like to see. And did I hear you, Steve, say that considering the timeline for our 24 solicitation, which we're going to be letting loose this fall, our opportunity for major, major changes is probably less, but lots of opportunity for the 26 one. Yeah, that's uh, that's the point we're trying to get across. Um, the LART, this, you know, what the key tasks you have right here, we're going to we're going to start that this summer. And so when I talked about the overlap there, you know, um, we'll be digging into some of the bigger topics as as soon as, uh, you know, summer fall hits us here with a consultant, you know, it's going to be a consultant study. Yep. So it's coming pretty quick, actually. And with the big study being done and we're expecting a lot of changes, that's why we're building a little bit more time to do it so that we can have time to build the new application online too. Yep. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes. Hi, thank you. This is Angie Sensen with Carver County. Um, I'd like to add to the kind of the long term redo discussion that um, it it would be helpful to understand from this kind of more policy perspective what impacts uh, we're trying to make as a region for the system. So right now we have, as we know, lots of different scoring criteria, and we do that kind of by weighting the different um, different measures, uh, but it it would be helpful to tie it to our performance measures to understand from a policy perspective what you know not on a project level, but how much we want to invest towards different uh, potentially specific areas. And uh, actually, I was thinking about this in relationship to uh, safety coming up. Uh, most recently and the impact that we're having with our investments on safety and it um it it is worrisome to me uh, and and these are not carver county projects uh, but just as a region that in the spot mobility safety care category the projects with the second and third highest safety score were not funded and likewise in the reconstruction category where we had a record investment of 106 million dollars the project that was tied for the top safety score did not receive funding. And those are the types of outcomes that, uh, I guess that that bother me and that I'd like to uh, really understand and uh, make sure that, that we're uh, proposing a system that gets to the outcomes that we, uh, you know, that, that are important to our policy makers. Um, so that that's on that. I also have some feedback about the the short term piece for 24. Yeah, okay, um, we go to it. There we go. Okay, thank you. So uh, this I I do understand this schedule. Um, I I heard some feedback at the TPP work group about uh, local agencies being concerned with the switch in calendar year and budgeting potentially. Uh, so you know this moves most of the work from. 24 calendar year to 23. Uh, I don't know that that's a deal breaker, but it, it would be good to get feedback from more agencies on that. Um, likewise, um, and it's not necessarily a, a Carver County concern, but uh, not making any changes to the RBTN bike barrier, truck tiers, or functional class. That has been very useful for local agencies in the past. Um, and although I'm not sure that we would have any changes, uh, maybe a concern from others. So I just want to be sensitive to that uh, and and get a little bit more feedback uh, before going that direction. So thanks. Good. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair and Angie. So that's maybe something some agencies can think about too. If uh, that approach here, we're going to bring this to TAC next and and to TAB here uh, versions of this PowerPoint. Um, the first point I thought was pretty good on safety. Um, we should look into that a little bit more. The uh, we did look in at the projects that were funded and the list, kind of how far we went down each, each of them without jumping a project. And it turns out we did uh, maximize kind of the or did maximize the safety benefit uh, of those projects. And but I think your point is, there were projects that scored high with safety that 
um, weren't at the top of that list to get funded. They were further down those lists and likely because we watered down the scoring and gave points across nine or 10 different measures. And that um, has the effect of watering down the scoring so that the, maybe the things you want from an application category, you're not getting in the end because of it. I think that's, if I read in what you're, what you're saying, um, I think, I think that's where you're coming across. And again, that's absolutely what's happening, right? We have yeah. multiple yep. priorities all reflected in how many points we give them. And so the, to be a safety project and get funded, you don't necessarily have to be the best safety project, which is obvious, obviously what happened, right? All our other priorities trumped it. Yeah. Cause they, uh, you didn't do a little of this or a little of that. Um, across 10 categories, 10 criteria, and, and um, yep. that diminished the... Others have any comments or questions? Mr. Chair, this is uh, Scott Chinoyak from Metro Transit. I think I have a question or a comment for MTS staff. This slide is relevant here. Just so I'm kind of understanding the scope, I, get a, I hear a lot of questions about um, specific questions in the applications themselves and inconsistencies kind of across applications within a specific question. I guess my question is, is it within scope for this evaluation effort to kind of dive in to each specific application and look at the language of questions and see if we can improve that? Or is that kind of out of scope here and we're trying to do more of a bigger picture evaluation of kind of what we want the regional solicitation to look at and operate at within that 30,000 foot view? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair and Scott. So uh, the answer to the question is we will dig into the measures. Um, that will be at the end of the process. So first we need to get kind of an idea on some of those first ones from the specifically from the policymakers where, you know, what are the high level kind of goals, objectives that they want to focus on. Um, then eventually we'll get down to kind of the, the measures, how they're written, probably have subcommittees um, like we did before for each of the modes or, or even within there, um, within a mode. And some of the measures may remain and some of them may change. Some of them may be added, but that will be the, the technical details that I imagine people that are on funding and programming will, will be asked to be part of. That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. For the last round, we had TAB and the council members meeting through a couple workshops to identify the criteria. So what were the priorities on a higher level? And then they went to the working groups, the modal working groups to come up with the measures under each one of them. And they, they did use some measures from the previous applications and then came up with new ones. So I would expect we would do the same. And then even after that, each cycle we've been tweaking them as we call it or adding measures, changing them. Um, for example, the transit ridership one changed from from if it's modernization, it's existing ridership. If it's expansion, it's new ridership. Or before it was both, and then we came, it was difficult to come up with those. So they got split to be different. So that's one thing as we're going through, looking at what changed from before and looking to see, was that needed or, and again, it's gonna be dependent on what criteria come out, which measures you'll need. Yeah. yeah. Others. Chair, yeah, I just had one other follow up comment, uh, Mr. Chair, if I could. This is Scott. Scott, go ahead. Um, I would be really interested to know how other metro areas determine how they, you know, the amount of funding that they ultimately allocate to the various project categories. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, you know, we have spot mobility, we have. Um, I forget what all the names of the categories are, but we probably have eight or 10 different categories um, that we fund. And uh, maybe there's a, a more of an objective way to allocate the funding to those categories than I'm aware of. But mm -hmm. um, you know, some of it's tied, like for bridges, we've got obviously there's a specific 
bridge allocation that we have, but I think we have, from my understanding, we have a fair amount of discretion in the federal regs as to how much funding we put into each of those pots that's ultimately open for competition within the region. And so um, I would really be curious in knowing how other regions go about making those types of decisions. Thank you. Good, good comment. We've kept it, you know, certainly uh, largely flexible on the front end until the projects came in and uh, then have kind of a debate at the end of the process. But uh, yeah, do people pre say 20 million is going to bridges, 10 million is going to re reconstruction on, on the front end? And that's a good question. And that was how the projects were selected previously. Yep. They were done by functional class. A certain amount was set aside for each one. And when the projects were rated, they realized that you were selecting projects based on the amount of money in each category, not necessarily if they were the best projects. So that was why they changed it to put all the money together, select the best projects, and then give them the money uh, eligible for. And the spot mobility is an example of an application that was added after. I mean, that was just added a couple cycles ago. So as we realized that there were projects safety related that were smaller, they couldn't score well enough in the roadway reconstruction modernization category. So a new category was created. So that would be something to look at. Is that still important? Yes, if it's a safety, if you're looking at safety being important, that's probably keep that category, but maybe changing some of the other categories or it, it becomes, a, it, it became, changes were made based on how projects were not getting selected, I'll call it that way, that were good projects but could not compete against the other ones. Um, and the, the other was we had the functional classification designation where TAB made a rule that you had to fund at least one of each classification to make sure that the lower classifications weren't all completely left out of any funding. So tweaks were made as we went through to make sure and that added the complicating things. So that's one thing we need to balance again is simplifying plus making sure all projects are eligible to receive funding because they all serve the region in some fashion. The reason I bring it up is I just, I think there's an opportunity for us to be a little more strategic about how we decide how much money we put in spot mobility or safety or bridges or bike pad or whatever. Not to say that the way that we do it now is wrong. I, I guess it works okay, but um, there could be, I think, a stronger strategic intentional uh, tie to those funding pot dollar amounts and what the, what we identify as needs and, and ultimate, you know, our ultimate vision for the region. I think one of the realities of our process is that it is a political process and that uh, regional distribution is always something that we're talking about. And so I think that people are always concerned about uh, all communities getting the same amount of money or so, or fair amounts of money. And there's always that, I think that always complicates the conversation a little bit. With regard to regional distribution, I always, you know, We've always measured that by where the project is located and uh, how much money that is. And then we put it on a map and see how it's distributed. I think with new technologies, I'm talking about street light data, we could rather easily tell who actually uses every project and we could make sure that people are, the region is adequately served, even if the project might not be in that exact location within the region. That's just a general comment. Jason, I thought I heard you jump in there. Were, were you looking to make a comment? Yes, Chair, thank you. Just a couple observations from Hennepin um, regarding the revised deadline for the 2024 solicitation. I know one thing that's come up in the qualifying requirements is that not only does the agency's ADA transition plan needs to be completed, but it needs to have been updated in the last five years. Um, just if that does go into place, that's a pretty big impact on applicants to if they need to get that plan updated between now and December, that's a really large lift. Um, also, 
Uh, regarding the HSIP solicitation, historically that's tailed regional solicitation by a couple months. So just be helpful to know if there's any whispers about HSIP moving up or if that's staying put kind of in that June timeframe. That's true. And then also in the 2022 solicitation, I recall a checkpoint before TAB made their decisions was to collect public comment. And I think that was kind of a new approach. And I feel like we got a lot of feedback from FNP and TAC. So I didn't see that checkpoint listed on the last slide. Just be helpful to maybe identify the timeline for public comment if um, Met Council's interested in uh, releasing a survey again. And then kind of to Angie Stinson's point about consultant assistance, um, you know, I think internally Hennepin County will just have to do some shifting of priorities. So getting back to that ADA transition plan comment, maybe we had earmarked operating budget monies to do a plan update. Well, then we kind of have to shift them over to do solicitation support instead and then kind of pause on our plan update. Okay. I can answer the first one. That I, we have not heard anything yet from FHWA of any changes for completing that ADA transition plan within five years. And so we don't require it unless FHWA would have required. And I know FHWA has a new staff that will be on our committees. I don't know, is Josh Pearson here? <laughs> Put him on the spot if he is. Day three. If he is, he's not going to say anything now. <laughs> I know. He just, I think Tuesday was his first day. <laughs> yeah, from my understanding, we, we haven't got any word from USDOT on, on an, an update um, of those ADA transition plans. Certainly, there's kind of best practices to update them regularly, but uh, I don't think we've got anything in writing otherwise that they have to be updated on a certain cycle. And we keep putting in there that it may change, but yeah. so far we haven't. They've been saying that the last couple cycles. So, all right, good yeah. comments. Uh, any additionals? Otherwise, we'll move along. Um, sorry, I feel like a chatty Kathy. Um, Maddie Dahlheimer <laughs> again, Washington County. So, Steve, I just wanted to maybe follow up um, with Jason's comment and get some clarification on the schedule. So, oh, for the 2024 schedule. So, you guys have. Um, obviously put some thought into this, um, but it sounds like it's not like a done deal yet. And you guys are kind of going through different committees to get feedback. Is there going to be, um, I mean, I guess, I'm, I guess what my, my question is going to be, what are the next steps or how are we going to stay post, stay up to date on kind of how this is changing and when are we looking to finalize this? Um, I think to both Angie and Jason's comment, like, if this is what it's going to be, it is what it is, and we will work around, shift around our workload and, and change some things to make sure we're hitting that target. But I think if there are, uh, you know, things that can happen to either simplify that process or streamline that, um, that would certainly be appreciated. Um, so I, I rambled a little bit, but my my questions are kind of how are we going to keep up to date on on the proposed schedule, and do we have a hard deadline to say this is for sure what we're moving forward with, um, and who else are you connecting with before you finalize that? Yeah, good good question. I appreciate all the input from from you and others here today. That's it's been good. So um, I think. The normal schedule where it would be kind of a November 2024 decision um, doesn't work uh, for us. So I think some movement is needed. And we played with everything from having an open application period as soon as this summer. And we felt kind of a good, a good kind of in between would be this fall. And if there's some movement a month or two either way from kind of what's shown on the screen here. But I think uh, kind of doing the normal schedule doesn't doesn't work. Um, for sure. And so I think this, unless we hear kind of compelling, kind of overwhelming, you know, kind of people against against us as we go to the to, to the tab meeting, I think some version of what you see here is likely where we'll, we'll end up, right, Elaine? Right. And if there's minimal or minor, very minor changes on the applications, mm -hmm. I would expect that completing the next round should be easier, especially if you're reapplying for any projects. It would be any brand new projects you'd be submitting, you would have to do the full work. 
and otherwise it would be reviewing your responses from the last one. You can look at the scores and maybe look at ways to improve the scoring that you received on your application. So again, it depends on how much effort per project that you would need to do and how many more you would plan to submit. Again, I think that I hear Maddie's question as, what is the process for finalizing the solicitation for 2024? So we have to have it out this fall. That means it has to be kind of approved by tab by when August or something, there has to be some enough time to actually yeah. put the solicitation out. And then we have a process to approve that solicitation. So I presume that starts with funding and programming and then it works its way through TAC and TAB. Um, so Next we will month. see it again. Yeah, the question is, <laughs> when would we have to approve it, roughly speaking, probably July-ish or August, right? Yeah, Elaine's got that and we've got more detailed than schedules that we were showing here, but um, we would have some sort of public input, uh, either public meeting or hearing um, yet to be determined on it. But remember when that was like when when a, an application uh, mm -hmm. would start at f and uh, uh, for their kind of approval of the application? You remember that, Elaine? I don't know. Uh, I can look it up quickly here. Yeah. Any in the meantime, as Elaine's looking, any other questions? hearing any okay we would look yes, at having you, tab uh, approve in may so public comment would go out in may and of may through june and so that would mean funding and programming and tag in april so that would give us february march yeah. april to make changes and then during the public comment period, you know, more changes could be made if and that recommendations can come through the committee. So this will likely be an agenda item on this committee's agenda for the next couple months. Correct. So that's we'll have to start having if you want to look at, you know, look at the responses to the surveys and see if there's anything you think should be that's critical to make changes to this 24. And then start thinking again for the 26th, because by the summer we would look at start having discussions on that one too. And this is why we wanted to shift it up so we could have two separate discussions on them. I think next All month right. we can, oh, sorry, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think next month we can bring a more detailed schedule. We have it uh, done, but didn't want to overwhelm you here at this meeting. And so, uh, you know, this will go through for a tab in February and kind of barring any kind of major changes, I assume the next day we would bring a detailed schedule to uh, to this committee. Thank you. So we would like to say, let us know what's crit critical for this next one that really was not working or, and we think we've gotten over the years tweaking each time mm -hmm. we've been able to make I mean, I think the last time we just added a safety measure to couple the applications. So I, otherwise, we didn't have too many changes the last round. Good. Again, we've all, we always make the improvements, like as Maddie was recommending, clarifying scoring guidance. So we keep modifying those to help clarify both for the applicant and the and the scorer. And those are easier changes because they're just text edits into the online system. Well, I see we're starting to lose people uh, from the meeting, so I'd like to get us moving along. So unless someone has a very compelling or, or immediate question, I think I'd like to kind of move along. Not hearing it. Uh, if we go back to our agenda, the next item, uh, I'm trying to find it here. There we go. So uh, th that concludes all our information items. Do we have any other business? And not hearing any, I think I can call this meeting uh, complete and we'll adjourn. So thank you all for a good conversation, especially about these last few items. Appreciate that. Have a good afternoon. Thanks, everybody.